Uh, now, besides Stephen uh, Roach's Giro win back in 1987, no other Irish rider had finished higher than 10th at that race uh, until, of course, the weekend just gone. So Eddie Dunbar taking one of the best ever general classification results by an Irish uh, cyclist at the Giro, finishing 7th overall, was as high as 4th as well at one point. Delighted to say Eddie Dunbar joins us on the line now this morning. Eddie, how are things? Not too bad. How are you? Keeping well, keeping well. Are you wrecked? Um, I'm actually not too bad, funny enough. But um, yeah, it's uh, the strangest thing is just like for three weeks, you're just obviously going around Italy and uh, you're just kind of in a routine and then all of a sudden you wake up and uh, yeah, it's just back to normal life really. But um, yeah, you're, you're just so zoned out for three weeks. Um, it, I'd say it takes like a couple of days to properly kick in before you realise, all right, I've done a three-week race there the last, the last while, you know. Because you wouldn't have a, a, a huge amount of Grand Tour experience, but when, when I say that, that, that you know, besides that win for Roach in 87, no other Irish cyclist had gotten into a top 10. I mean, it's quite an incredible achievement, and you had called it before before the Giro as well. You wanted a top 10 finish. Yeah, so like it was always the plan that I'd do the Giro this year, and um, in fe- 1st of February, first race for the new team, and uh, I broke my hand, so um, that kind of put a hamper on the preparations a bit. And yeah, basically... Yeah, there was a point where I thought, all right, I'm not even going to make it to the Giro. Um, I was in the cast for four weeks. Um, the bone didn't heal. Then I um, had to go see a hand surgeon in Manchester and then I had to get an operation on my hand to get a bone removed. And uh, there was just a massive whole rigmarole there. And um, yeah, but with the team and everything, we worked out a good plan. And yeah, we got to, we got to May. Um, in relatively good condition considering everything and uh, yeah it was just about going in seeing how it went and uh, thankfully it went pretty smoothly really and um, yeah I learned a lot there was a lot I can improve on as well which is massive positive after three weeks of racing you know I had to I had to laugh that Eddie when you were saying there's a lot I can improve on I was watching back last night I was at a couple of the stages uh, recorded and one of the ridiculously tough mountain stages where I don't know if they had four category one climbs but you you were in a little group of three Roglic was in front of you and I was like what is going through your head here where you're like I think you were fifth or sixth at the time in the in the standings and um, you were calling your own an incredibly tough stage like staying in the saddle I was looking at you I was like what has gone through this man's head and to still think you can improve and do better than this yeah I think it was just more so like as you said at the start this is I don't have much Grand Tour experience um, it's only my second Grand Tour the last one was four years ago so like um, normally when you're 26 years of age you have four or five D races in the bank and um, like compared to a lot of the guys my age I don't have that experience and um, yeah so to be in that company um, already in my second Grand Tour I think that's a massive positive um, but like even in terms of like being in that race situation against the best guys in the world um, you know they, them boys have been doing it for the last 10 years um, so as I said I have a bit of catching up to do but it was um, yeah at the time you don't you don't um, actually take it all in you know um, obviously Roglic Garen Thomas Almeida these three boys they've been fairly dominant the last few years winning bike races so to be in that company was it was fairly special looking back at it now but at the time I was like alright I can I want to stay here and I want to beat these guys you know how do you, um, how do you that, climb better? Um, just exposure to racing basically yeah um, I suppose you could go into the detail of it like with your race weight stuff like that um, going into the race but at the same time it's literally exposure to, to the, like racing on them long climbs um, like the Grand Tours and the main races where you have 20k climbs where you're going uphill for an hour like the week long stage races you might have one or two stage races where you're um yeah, you'd have a you'd have one long climb thrown in, but it's the Grand Tours where the longest climbs are yet. So like that's where you can um, really improve going up there and race at race rhythm, race pace, and um, yeah, there's only so much you can do in training. But it's just that exposure to racing and being able to push yourself, um, yeah, against the best guys. You know, I mean, you you could go out training and do a twenty k climb and go pretty fast up there, but. Um, you're, you're, you've nothing to gauge yourself off you know as I said you have these guys like Garen Thomas and Roglic the, 
some of the best climbers in the world, you know. So the the real test is to see how far they are ahead of you and try and make up that time, you know. The, the, this is a like this is probably a stupid question, but do you talk at all on these climbs? Like because when it's like I, I don't know if there's a more agonising thing physically in in the entire existence of sport than climbing. Um, maybe in hot weather in the Tour de France, whatever. But like, do you confer at all about like the pace that's going on here? Obviously, your different teams. Like, how does it work? Yeah. So basically. For instance, that day, I think it was stage 16, um, that day when there was me, Roglic, Almeida, mm. G, um, and Zana. We had Zana in the breakaway, the Italian mm. champion, and he dropped back. Um, so, for instance, he he was already up the road. He was four minutes ahead, but he stayed back because he knew I was coming across in the group with the other guys. So, um, we have radios while we race, so we can communicate back to our mm. DSs, Director of Sport Eve, um, back in the car and uh, I, like all the riders on the team so there's seven or eight of us they can all hear what we say on the radio and um, so literally it's a little we press a piece here we talk into it like that um, and we can communicate fairly well so it's a case of yeah I was feeling good that day so I told Zana got on the radio told him to go to the front um, a few times he went a bit too hard I let him know that fairly quick <laughs> not on the radio but um, I, I shouted uh yeah, but as I said, that's you just kind of go off feel really. But there is there is a lot of talking like amongst other guys and stuff, other teams, um, and it's like yes, it's like a game of chess on wheels sometimes, you know. It's funny because it's the same when you talk to jockeys about you know during a big race, you, you don't realize that they are some of them are having full blown mm. conversations, obviously about things pertinent to the race. But it's a it's it's a fascinating one when you look at it as well, Eddie. Like you're only what, what, seven and a half minutes. Behind Primoz Roglic at the end, that's after over th- you know over three weeks, three thousand four hundred and forty-eight kilometers. The gap's not huge at all. No, um, and I think I, a lot of that time um, I lost was in time trials as well. I'd mm. say four minutes of that was in individual time trials, of course. Um, which isn't that's that's another area that I can um, massively improve on. Um, we've done a lot of work on the TT bike. Um, in the off season with going to wind tunnels stuff like that um, but yeah that's the whole process just trying to dial in um, like on the day um, switching from like racing 200k to in an individual effort of 20 30k um, it's just a whole different kind of ball game you know um, but as I said that's that's an area I can really improve that's where I lost most of my time and uh yeah, that's that's certainly something to look at. Because in terms of like climbing, I think yeah, as I said, I was up there with um, the best riders in the race in terms of climbing. So that was a massive positive. Do, does then, that like uh, do, does it? Do you have to blink uh, and think like when you say that? Like you just say it so nonchalantly. Like you were up there with the best climbers in the world in the Giro. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, but as I said, it's just uh, all I like. I just want an opportunity in these races. Um, I've kind of, as I said, there's a, like there's only so much you can gauge in training, and um, obviously, I work closely with um, the team coach and everything, and uh, we know we know like the ability I can go up a hill in training. That's not um, that's not an issue. But as I said, it's just trying to replicate replicate that in a race. And uh, as I said, I think um, the amount we learned like this last three weeks in terms of that is, is massive and as I said once once we dial in on the, the final <coughs> details I think um, yeah as I said, that, hopefully we can get that gap a bit smaller but um, yeah like that last that last two days uh, I think it was stage 19 stage 20 that was the days I lost a bit of time as well but um, yeah it was stage 19 I woke up and uh, my chest was at me I was after picking up something but I'd say half the peloton went through some sort mm. of illness um, in the three weeks because we, we got soaked to the skin 14 days in a row, you know, so that it was bound to, our immune systems were down, racing five, six hours a day. So it's just like there was something bound to kick in. I was just hoping it'd kick in um, this week when I was off the bike as opposed to the two hardest days in the race. But again, that's that's no excuse. It's, um, yeah, it's part of a grand tour, trying to figure out how to get through it as healthy as possible and, uh, yeah, avoiding all kinds of trouble like crashes and all that, which we did very well. Um, so as I said, it's all in all, it was it was a it was a positive positive three weeks, and um, yeah, as I said, just that last two days, I was fairly disappointed in myself, but it was uh, yeah, looking back on it, it, it wasn't so bad, I guess. What, what was the take? And can you explain this to people who wouldn't? Most people listening wouldn't won't be aware of this. What was the take on Roglic's gear set for? Was it the <laughs> the, the 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 really pivotal stage where he'd like was it like a forty two at the back or something like that? It was like mad looking. Oh, it was crazy, yeah, because it was the day before as well. 
for the last um, steep climb, I don't know, we'd one long shorter kind of was it 4k and then we had 3k uphill but he changed his bike at the bottom of the climb um, and we were all like we were all like chatting like Fuck, what happened? like what happened there you know <laughs> we thought he punctured but uh, he came back with a one just a single chain ring bike and um, and I'd say it was just a pure like test to see how it would go for the day after that was my my take on it um, but uh, yeah it was as I said that's, that's what it comes down to now um, in cycling like games like that I think um, like that last TT, it was, it was like four or five k at fifteen, sixteen percent average. Like not for <laughs> thing, it was average. So it's just like you, you had to get the bike light as possible, and you have to get your pacing right. Um, so like li- little things like that, take your chain ring off your bike. It might only save, uh, I don't know, fifty, sixty grams, but like that could be that could be a second or two on that gradient, you know, which is is pretty mad when you think about it. Um, but yeah, as I said, he that last TT was super impressive from him uh, um, he said he's from Slovenia and um, I think it was that TT's 10k from the Slovenian border so there was a, a sea of Slovenian flags going up the climb um, but yeah as I said that was fairly impressive by him because um, G had a had a everyone I'd say thought like G had the pink sewn up I certainly did anyway and uh, yeah so yeah chapeau to Roglic he had a I'd say it was probably his best day ever on a bike you know you talk about avoiding the crashes there as well, Eddie, and, and there was even a close, close enough call in the last hundred meters of the final stage as well. But uh, that that um, June twenty seventeen accident that you had, where you go over the handlebars and it's a severe concussion, five months essentially off the bike. Um, I think I remember you talking at one point as well that you were maybe a couple of weeks away from from quitting the sport essentially. Um, what what was that experience like? Because that 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 was a, a horrific crash to go through. Yeah, because the funny, like, it's not funny, I guess, but the the thing about that crash was there was, like, I didn't have any cuts or, um, like, I did the usual, like, bruises or whatever from hitting the deck hard, but, um, yeah, like, that thing, I, I didn't have much um, knowledge on concussion at the time. Um, it wasn't a thing in cycling. We wear helmets, I guess. People think, oh, if you have a helmet, you're, you're protected. Um, so... Yeah, I, I went through a really bad phase, being honest. Um, like I can't, I can remember my head going towards the floor after the accident is a fairly um, fairly blurry experience, you could say. Um, and yeah, it was, I didn't know what was wrong. I knew there was something wrong. And uh, like it was a few days after, I took three days off the bike and the nationals were coming up and um, like I, I had constant pain in my head, you know. Um, I couldn't stand the bright light. I couldn't stand like music. Couldn't watch TV. I couldn't train. I couldn't concentrate. Um, but like as I said, I couldn't. I couldn't see anything physically wrong with myself. So it was very hard to. Um, it was it was hard to see. I was like, I don't know what's wrong, you know. Um, obviously, I was fairly young as well, so I was like, I didn't didn't even think of um, yeah the effects of concussion or anything like that and I just remember going out training one day after the crash and I was with one of my friends Dara O'Mahony and uh, I was going along the road and any time I hit a bump I just it's like the pain in my head was unbelievable and I said it to him and he was just like yeah that's that's not good you know um, and then I said like I told him oh come on we'll do an effort here I want to see if my head hurts or whatever and uh I was, he was just like, no, no, you don't need to do that. I was like, no, I have to see what's wrong. And uh, I start, we start to do this effort. And the first thing he said to me was like, he's like, if anything happens to you, no, this isn't my fault. And I was like, yeah, Graham. But like, we started to do this effort and the pain in my head after, I was just like, right, there's there's something wrong. But I continued training, um, went to race, but I got progressively worse. My personality completely changed. Um, yeah, I was probably crying once or twice a day. I'm not a big crier. Um, but yeah, that's completely emotional wreck I was. Um, I was sleeping for three or four hours a night. Um, yeah, that didn't help. Then obviously that leads to other things, anxiety, um, panic attacks, stuff like that. Um, and it was just like a roller coaster of, um, yeah, emotion really. Uh, didn't stop training, didn't, didn't race for like eight months. And it wasn't until the follow that happened in, June or July 2017 and it wasn't until the following December um, I did my first ever SCAT test which is I think it's fairly mandatory in most sports now to do this SCAT test and uh, I remember um, 
the team doctor he did it with me and I I got the first three questions wrong in the scat test and this was um, this was six months after the crash and he he just turned around to me and he said have you been he said have you been properly assessed since your crash and I said no I, I haven't you know um, so then he got the ball rolling on that I went to see a guy in Dublin and um, it was only at that point the guy in Dublin um, I was with him for two hours did all the tests and uh, he just said yeah he said you were you were severely concussed you know um, it's no it's no wonder you're feeling like this um, so as I said then that's when we it was it was clear that there was there was an underlying issue uh, but as I said it was a very slow process then um, I was very that it was January that year I was very close to calling it a day in the bike completely couldn't couldn't concentrate lost the love for cycling um, and everything and that took you know, that took a while to build back up which was strange um, and yeah it was just a strange feeling you do, you do something for so long and then all of a sudden um, yeah something like that as I said it was something you couldn't see so that was really frustrating and uh, I just thought right yeah this is it this is I, I can't do this anymore because the mental impact it was having on me but um, I got I, in the end I got the help I needed went to see the right people talked to the right people and um, yeah as I said it was a slow build up but um, yeah it was a that was probably one of the biggest biggest learning experiences I'd say of my life really yeah that that whole eight to nine months it's bad stuff like it's brilliant to hear that um, like, and like I know Imogen Cotter has done stuff about her crash like recently and um different crash and all that I, I do wonder with cyclists right if you look at say what, if you, what Sam Bennett did in the tour when he was when he got the green jersey and that year um, in the personality vote he loses out to Katie Taylor I had a real issue with that I was like so you're telling me the, the, the best sprinter in cycling is inferior to somebody in boxing in female boxing you know it's such a small pool do you, do you feel that cycling in Ireland we have Ben Healy now coming up we have yourself we still have obviously Sam Bennett on the go we've come through having some good cyclists do you, do you feel that we have potential here for people to actually realise how good our cyclists can be and the difficulty of the sport as well and get more people into it yeah um yeah, I think yeah, it's like that that time. Um, I'm, of course, I'm going to be biased, but I I, I thought it was fairly. Um, for me, it was obvious that Sam should have won the um, the sports personality that year, um, and that's taking absolutely nothing away from the other people, but just being a being a cyclist and uh, knowing how hard that what Sam achieved. Um, how hard that would have been was absolutely incredible um, and especially in that year as well like the level that year you always hear it in 2020 because no one knew when we were going to race next there was guys needing contracts so like the level went up absolutely crazy high because guys were like Genie, I need a job next year you know like I don't know when we're going to race next and um, no one knew what was happening so like everyone was just racing like every day was their last race um, and that year Sam yeah, he's and he still is one of the best sprinters in the world. He's one of the fastest man on two wheels, and uh, um, it's yeah, it's, it's incredible actually what, what he does um, and how he does it in in that like how fast they go on them sprints, how much they risk their lives, and it's unbelievable, genuinely. But uh, yeah, I think like I'm I'm good mates with Sam, and we always talk about how um, it's really important to us cycling in Ireland. We grew up there from. We were both you know, 11, 12 cycling there in our clubs and it's really, it's something we're passionate about and um, as we always say, like if it's something, if something like that even gets two or three lads or girls to take up the bike, um, yeah, that's, that's what we want, you know. Um, it's funny seeing like Annalise like, Murphy, what she's, the times like that she's doing and it's like, well, Annalise is an incredible sportswoman but like, I, I'm always of the opinion like, throw kids at everything that they can. Seeing as a young Corkery from your own neck of the woods winning the Ross as well, like, there's something, there's something cool about getting involved young. Yeah, and I think like, you've other, like, other disciplines of cycling as well that are coming into it, um, like, cyclocross is very popular now in Ireland it's a winter technically a winter sport where um, you can go and you ra literally it's like cross country but on a bike you know you race around the field and I think that's a lot more appealing maybe for um, for parents um, as well having their kids do something like that because if they there's no um, there's no safety hazard there at all you know uh, obviously cycling on the road is pretty dangerous now um, and I can understand why parents would probably have an issue with that um, letting their kids go out on the road and unless they were supported um, that's absolutely fair but like the cyclocross 
thing is a great thing like you it's fun it's social it's a good like um, it's a good day out at the weekend for all families you know um, and they do all ages from I think it's like five up to senior so it's like um, yeah you, they can go there it's, it's a great way to learn skills um, and then as the older they get you can kind of progress them out onto the road but that's like discipline like that is a great absolutely yeah brilliant way to get on the bike you know and it's insane as well just to think of, of the, I was actually watching the, the Ross Talton pass through Monaghan recently and to see Dylan Corkery go on and win it from that final leg from Monaghan to, to Black Rock and I know uh, you're both Bantier men as well I think so there's something in the water clearly down there so cycling is uh, is a hot pot of that area Do you know what I love it about Eddie he said after last week he said my ambition is to win the Tour de France right mm-hmm. and people uh, like it's an out, almost like an outlier in Ireland to be that's my ambition and whether you like it or not I think it's reasonable so yeah and and you were saying there a minute ago, Eddie, when you're talking about your concussion story. Like I remember the video, the mad video of uh, the, I'm going to butcher his pronunciation, the Latvian cyclist Tom Skuyans who uh, uh, falls off his bike in the Tour of California in 2017, the same yeah. year you had your crash, and it's terrifying because he gets up off the bike and essentially starts staggering between these cyclists coming downhill at ridiculous pace. He, he's almost killed, um, and he's clearly severely concussed. Same, same as yourself. You said you fell out of love with the sport. How did you fall back in, back in love with the sport? Did it take time? Yeah, it took a lot of time. Um, like that whole year, um, that was the year I was. I joined Aka Blue. That was the first Irish professional team. I was there, and uh, yeah, it basically, I just had to build up slowly. I wasn't. I I didn't train properly until like March that year, um, and then slowly but surely, I just went race to race, um, and just built up like. Uh, yeah, there was no pressure or anything. And then I just slowly start to enjoy it again, um, start to train well, um, and just kind of got back into a rhythm. Um, and there were still bits and pieces I was suffering from the concussion. As I said, like there's there's still some things now that I have um, from it. But as I said, you just kind of accept that and get on with it. But uh, yeah, at that time it was just like, was getting through getting through the year and I got through it fairly well and I actually started to feel good on the bike I got a few results that built my confidence um, more so to say right I actually haven't too much training done and I can still still compete here so that's um, that kind of this game spurred me on a bit to think alright no there is still something there I'd be I'd be stupid not to um, pursue it you know mm. um, so as I said thankfully it, it all worked out in the end Listen, Eddie, fascinating stuff. Um, we'll be continuing to follow your, your story very closely. No doubt you'll be challenging on podiums, uh, grand tours, uh, consistently now going forward, we'd imagine. Uh, really, really good, good good stuff over the last number of weeks and uh, delighted to, to to have you happen on this morning. So fair play, Eddie. Well done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, Eddie, as well, the, the next time I'm cycling up to the Mount Leinster Mast, I'll think, how would Eddie Dunbar do it? <laughs> You'll be thinking about Eddie and yeah. the Golemites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. <laughs> Eddie, great stuff. You'll be changing by. Cheers. Thanks, lad. <laughs> Thanks a million. Eddie Dunbar there. Fascinating athlete. Just like... Up. Honestly, uh, we don't have time here, but what these lads are doing is unbelievable. Like yeah. the, the the pain, the torture, and for Eddie to be at that level w- with so much to come is insane. And like mm. it's it's um, I know cycling is a peripheral sport in Ireland, but like we have a great history, and um, it's insane what he achieved last week. His mindset, and even the likes of Ben Healy challenging as well, and mm. you know it's just incredible stuff what they're doing. So uh, you'd imagine the sport is only going to go on an upward curve with with those lads challenging at big uh, at big events. 